Welcome everyone. My name is Steve Meisek and I'm a social media specialist at Rush University Medical Center. Thank you everyone for joining us. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Latanya Logan, a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Rush. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for um, let's just start by telling us a little bit about what you do at Rush. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. So uh, I am, as you said, a pediatric infectious diseases doctor at Rush, so I do see patients, um, but I also do research, uh, and I actually do research on antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, in my other roles, I'm the hospital epidemiologist, so I, I am dealing with COVID and those kind of things. And um, I am the chief of our, my section and the vice chair of research for the Department of Pediatrics. Great. And so today we're going to be talking about kids and COVID. And our understanding of how kids are affected by COVID has changed. When we started out the pandemic, we kind of thought that it was really young ones weren't affected so much. And then these days, it seems like that's starting to change. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's changed and, and uh, what the situation is now for kids and COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, it's it's more than one reason that this is occurring right now. The first part of it is actually, in some ways, a good reason. So when we started vaccinating, um, our priority was to vaccinate the healthcare workers and the seniors, so the age 65 and older. And now we're at the point where 80% uh, of seniors are vaccinated, right? So when you see COVID right now, you're seeing a younger age group who's getting COVID infections. And so the children are within that younger age group. Now, why is it different this wave though than the prior waves? And the, one of the big reasons for that is the strain or the strains that are out are mm. more contagious. So the children are also affected by these more contagious strains. And now we're starting to see children who used to not have any symptoms or be affected now are infected and you can actually see them with symptoms. Are they, are we seeing hospitalization rates similar to like what it was for adults before as it relates to kids? So that's a great question. We are not seeing a ton of children being hospitalized. There are more kids being hospitalized um, in certain regions right now uh, who are having, you know, such as Michigan and some of the areas in the East Coast that are seeing some very large surges of mm -hmm. uh, cases of uh, COVID in children. And, um, but what we are seeing is about a third of the kids who are hospitalized have severe disease. So it is uh, an, enough children who are being hospitalized. However, it's still a low fraction of all of the children who have COVID that actually have symptoms that require any type of medical care. I see. And um, are you seeing that like, is this just, is it just because of this variant is more infectious in general, or does this seem to have a different impact on kids um, just because of how, what the variant is? Yeah, that's a great question. I, we're, we're still learning about these variants and there's, there's really a few of these variants of concern that are out there right now, right? So the big one here in our region and across the U.S. is this B117, which has also been called the U.K. variant right. as to where it started. That strain has taken over as the most common strain we're seeing, and we know it overall to be more contagious. So I don't think that it's necessarily that it's just a kid thing. I just think that this strain, just like if you have a bad flu season, this strain itself is more contagious. It's going to affect more people. Gotcha. That makes sense. So kids have also, not, or not all, but a lot of kids have gone back to in-person learning and they're you know, around their peers again. Do we feel like in-person learning is contributing to the spread, or is it just the... The, the variant itself? Yeah, great question. This comes up a lot. I have two kids of my own, they're age seven and 10, and they are at in-person school and mm -hmm. I'm completely comfortable with them being there. I think in-person school is not the problem. Hmm. If you look at transmission within schools that are following the mitigation strategy, so meaning they are social distancing, they are doing their hand hygiene, they have good ventilation, they are masking. Mm -hmm. um, these schools are not seeing transmission rates that are higher than a half percent total. Mm -hmm. So that means if you look at transmission within school, to find one transmission within the school, you'd have to test like 200 people. You know, wow, okay. whereas it what is really contributing to it is the events that are taking place outside of the school. So kids, you know, on their play dates or kids at their youth sports, which mm. is a big deal. Um, kids who are congregating and having meals together. It's or the kids who are not, um, you know, using the mask etiquette. Mm. The other thing is that now 80 percent of teachers are vaccinated. That's huge. If the teachers aren't contributing to spread, 
and now you're getting 16 and 17 year olds vaccinated, the risk of the transmission in schools is even that much more plummeted. So I don't think that schools are going to be a big factor going forward. That's I'm sure that's very reassuring to parents. Um, you mentioned youth sports um, when you were talking, and I, I understand that I've heard I've heard it said that youth sports have been a big contributor, and not to, not necessarily because of when they're playing, but because of when they're traveling or stuff like that. Can you talk to about that at all? Absolutely. Yes. So that's exactly right. So people are wondering why would the kids be getting infected in youth sports? You know, of course, being inside those sports are going to be at a higher risk, right? Because you're you're in these settings where it's closed off, maybe the ventilation isn't as good, the children aren't in, in contact with each other. One of the big things is where they are when they are next to each other, um, you know, in spaces like the bench, right? Um, let's say you're outside and playing baseball and you're in a dugout, mm -hmm. right? You're right next to each other. I mean, that's the way it was. It's still like that. So we have to work on the spacing of those children and their masks. You know, some kids are very good. There are <clears throat> leagues around with basketball where the kids wear the mask the whole time. There's no, not any transmission that's going on in those areas. However, there are several where the kids are not as good at that. Neither are the coaches. We see that sometimes, right? And that is where you're going to start to see this transmission happen. Um, additionally, kids do things like share water bottles. Um, right. You know, so you have to be willing to put in the effort to make sure that the children are following the strategies. If they are, then I think some of them can be very safe. But I do think that the contact sports are going to be a lot more difficult um, to control, um, particularly because the kids are so used to being next to each other and then they let their guard down a little bit easier. Sure, that makes good sense. So I've heard it said the only way to, for us to reach herd immunity as a society is to vaccinate kids. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, it's so it's so funny. Uh, Dr. Fauci just came out and you know he's like, I'm done talking about herd immunity. And you know, part of the issue is that we really just want to get people vaccinated. Right. But we have to think about it like this: vaccination is not mandatory. And there's a whole section of the country of of society that doesn't want to get vaccinated. They are not willing to do it. In this case. The children are very important, right? Because there's going to be a, a whole area of people that may live near each other that aren't vaccinated. And that is going to put that whole community at risk. Mm. So herd immunity is important in terms of not just overall immunity for U.S., but pockets of people all over the U.S. that need to be vaccinated um, are not getting vaccinated. In those areas, kids would be helpful. In our area, if all the adults are vaccinated, then the kid vaccination is less important because we're not going to spread it to the kids. But I, overall, I think that the kids are going to be super important because they're going to be the only ones left not to be vaccinated. And then the last thing I'll just say about that is, if you think about herd immunity, what really is important is the global immunity. Mm -hmm. We travel. We all go outside, come to the country, this kind of thing. So we really need to think about it from that more of a standpoint of we need to get everyone vaccinated, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Right, right. So many parents were eager to get vaccinated themselves as soon as they possibly could. But when it comes to vaccinating kids, sometimes people are a little bit more hesitant or worried. They have concerns, obviously, that it's still not available yet to kids, but what would you say to parents about thinking about vaccinating their kids for COVID? Well, the first thing I would say is that the minute the vaccine's approved, and I've looked at all this data, and I'm, I'm convinced that it, these are going to be very safe in children, um, that I will get my children vaccinated. Hmm. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring up is that, you know, if we really think about vaccines in the hundreds of years that we've been giving them, most of the vaccines are given in childhood from the hmm. time we're born. Um, until we're 100 plus, right? We're getting vaccines. And these are safe. You know, the side effects that we see from vaccines are very rare. And most commonly, the, the mild things like getting a sore arm or whatever are not, they're, they're short lived. They start, you know, at the very beginning of the time in which you got it, and they end very quickly after the time in which you got it. There are not a lot of long term issues that have ever been associated with any of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't look at this vaccine any different than the childhood vaccines that we give that have saved millions and millions of lives. This one also will do the same thing. So, like I said, you can come in line with me and my kids the minute it <laughs> comes out because we'll be there. Great. Well, that's a ringing endorsement <laughs> if I've ever heard of yes. it. Yes. Um, so as the summer approaches, um, many parents are starting to think about um, sleepaway camps. And, um, you know, what guidance would you give parents who are trying to navigate whether or not that feels safe or whether that's the right thing for them? 
kids. Yes, this is this is a hot button topic, I will say. I um, you know, get this a lot. It's a very good question. And I think it's gonna be dependent on where your kids are at the time, where they live, mm. where is the camp? What research have you done to look at this camp to know that they're following the mitigation strategies? What happened last summer? Did they have a camp? Um, there have been some summer camps that we know had lots of outbreaks within them that were in the sleepaway camps. The day camps, on the other hand, have not had a, hmm. a substantial problem. So I think that each camp is going to have to have a really solid plan as to how they're going to keep their staff and their children from getting infected. The other thing that I will say that uh, will be helpful is if the, you know whether or not their staff are vaccinated. Hmm. You want to know if the staff are vaccinated. And we know that hopefully Pfizer, who has already um, filed for an amendment to get their vaccine um, approved for a 12 to 15 year old, um, if your kid is going to get that vaccine in May or June, then that child is actually even more you know, a likely somebody who would be okay to go to the sleepaway camp. <clears throat> so I think that overall, during a time where there's a surge, it's hard to say, yeah, you know, I, I would really send my kids anywhere. I, for me, I couldn't do it. Sure. But I think that some parents will have that option, particularly uh, if they have a great camp that has these mitigation strategies in place, they have high vaccination rates, and they're going to, you know, have these children who possibly are also vaccinated at camp. Right. So what's the timeline looking like for being able to vaccinate um, younger ones than, than are, who are currently uh, available to get it now? So it's a great question. So 12 to 15, Pfizer put in the amendment a couple weeks ago. So we actually think by May um, or June that Pfizer will get that approval because it was uh, by their, uh, their statement, it was 100% protective in children. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that they will get their approval and that'll be great. So then those kids will be okay from May and June and going into the summer. The littles, as I call them, the six month to 11 years where my kids are in that cohort, they've started the trials. Mm. Um, if Pfizer has started their trials. Moderna has also started the, those trials. They're, they've been a little bit slow uh, on the, the front end while they're just getting, make sure everything's in place. Mm -hmm. But we anticipate that those trials will be done and that hopefully those children in the youngest age group will have a vaccine by the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022. I see. Do we know anything about how Johnson, if, or if Johnson & Johnson is going to be partic participating for, for kids as well? Yes, they did. They okay. Actually, uh, Johnson & Johnson also has been doing 12 to 17 year olds. Um, I think everything's on pause right now mm. for them, but, but yes, they have also started their trials in 12 to 17, which will be great because that's a one-shot vaccine for the kids. Right. Can you, I, I know that many of us know about the John, what's been going on with Johnson & Johnson, why it was paused, but would you mind just telling, filling us in just because for someone who maybe doesn't know? Oh, sure, absolutely. So um, what had occurred is, you know, basically what we've learned is that the system works. Um, there's something called VAERS, which is a, basically a system where people, anybody, can enter in side effects that they have from vaccines, mm. including doctors, you as a person, anyone can enter this in. It's been working beautifully. And how do we know that? Because there were six cases of uh, people who had had blood clots after the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that had occurred between about a week and two week or two after they've gotten the vaccine, mm -hmm. that's six people out of se over seven million. So the the rate of this occurrence is very very low, mm -hmm. and there may be something about these particular people um, that has allowed them to have these low platelets where they are having these low platelets normally cause bleeding but are associated with clotting. So that vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson, and also the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not approved here, but they are, they are a very similar type of vaccine. They are also looking at in the edit in the other countries that use that. And all of that collated data is being looked at by ACIP, uh, which is our immunization practice uh, uh, body that works with the CDC that you know, validates whether or not we should use this. They will be meeting Friday and we will know uh, whether or not we're gonna resume the vaccine. We believe that they will likely resume at this point. It's really looking at these last couple weeks and seeing if they have more cases. Right, and I know that one of the things that I've heard a lot said is that birth control causes blood clots at a, at a higher rate than, than this does. It absolutely and, does. And so I think that's something, it's good for people to know, have that context that it's yeah. not just, that this isn't necessarily statistically that important yes. relative to of the abundance of concern that's being put into it. Or looking at it as it's happened in less than one in a million people. Right. 
so you know call yourself one in a million you know that's a good thing in some ways and but this in this side it's you know one of those rare side effects right we've had a couple cu questions from sure. the audience um the first one um babies mm -hmm. are babies susceptible to getting COVID if they're not wearing masks so it's a great question. So, you know, what's really cool about the vaccines is pregnant women have been getting vaccines or pregnant people have been getting <laughs> vaccines. And we found now that the antibodies can actually pass on to the baby. So similar to the other vaccines that we use, um, the, the infant will have antibody protection mm -hmm. um, against the, uh, the COVID uh, for maybe up to six months. So for those babies whose moms are vaccinated, they're probably in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Once you get where the, they lose the maternal immunity, that protection that we give them, then that's where the baby's at risk. And that baby is at just as much risk as the toddler or the mm -hmm. older kid. Um, I don't think that babies have been spared through this. Uh, I do think that they have been sheltered more through this. Sure. And now if people are more likely to be coming around each other, um, then per, it will be likely that babies, we will be starting to see the babies come in with COVID. Um, we do see some of them now. I will also say that we're starting to see some of the cold viruses that we didn't see during the, the, the winter, now starting to see them at this point of the year because people are starting to come back together. Right. So the babies are not just gonna be necessarily sick with COVID, they may catch RSV or the cold vi rhinovirus or any of these other flu um, just the same. Right. That actually makes me wonder about flu in general. I, like, w as someone who's a specialist, since we had very low flu cases because of the pandemic, do we do we do you anticipate there being a rise in cases this year? Because as things get back to normal, it's really interesting. So in um, in Australia, <laughs> that's what happened in the off season when people were getting back together. So in during you know our, their summer and our winter are you know. Uh, at the same time. So mm -hmm. they started to see the increases in the cases of these things during the off season. It is quite possible that we will also see that occur. So an off season flu, basically a summer flu or that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, that may occur. We have not seen it yet. That was in Western Australia where they had these problems. So it's possible that mm -hmm. um, we will, we hope that that doesn't happen. Um, the other thing we should realize is that next winter we have a chance of a, a very difficult season, uh, particularly if we stop masking. Um, right. If, if we don't do this anymore, then we're going to be at risk for all the rest of the viruses. So it'll, time will tell. Um, we, we actually like this because we've seen less of these cases, but we know this isn't forever. Right. Absolutely. So s s talking about masks, um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about um, guidance as it relates to wearing masks outdoors, how, ne how necessary it is to wear masks when we're walking on the street. Or, so I just wondered, do you have any guidance for, like, what people, how people might want to make the decision themselves about the, about if they want to wear a mask when they're outside? Well, I will say that, you know, depends on if you have a mandate, right? Mm. If there's a mandate uh, like we have here, then you're supposed to wear your mask wherever you are. Let's say you're though somewhere else where you don't have to wear the mask. You have a choice in wearing the mask. I think there's a lot that goes into that decision. How comfortable do you know the people who you're with? Um, how, do you know if they're vaccinated? Um, you know, so, so some of these games, we're seeing these ball games, right? Baseball games, stadiums full of people. And you think, you know, wow, is, you know, how, how is this going to work? You know, but I think um, you, if you know that the people you're around are relatively safe, you're in a kind of bubble of place because you have all these vaccinated people, then it's probably okay. I think that the issue is that we tend to let our guard down again if we let our mask down. We might be starting to hug people. Mm. We might start to share these bottles. We might do these things. So I think it's less risk if you're just walking your dog. But if you're about to go meet somebody, um, you really have to think of, have some pause about having that mask down when you're outside because you just don't know what they have at that point. Right. Thank you for that guidance. I, I will certainly apply that myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have to wrap it up, but thank you so much, Dr. Logan, for appearing with us and talking to us today about uh, kids and COVID. It's been very enlightening. I'm sure everyone else got a lot out of it as well. <laughs> um, and please visit rush.edu slash vaccine for any questions about vaccine or rush.edu slash COVID for our uh, latest updates around COVID. And please stay tuned for more great Facebook Lives from Rush University Medical Center. Thanks, everyone.